In the previous episode, we covered the first two dynastic periods of Mesopotamia, Sumerian and Akkadian, which ended at about 2200 BC. Now we will talk about the rest of the Middle East in that same time period, from the flood of Noah to the fall of the Akkadian dynasty at 2200 BC. The Mycenaean and the Minoan are the earlier ancestors of the Greek civilization. The Minoan dominated the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea until about 1400 BC, when the Mycenaeans took their place. For our time period of 2200 BC, the time of the Akkadian Kingdom, we will focus on the Minoan. The Minoan capital was Gnosis on the island of Crete. Little was known of them until 1900 when the British archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans discovered the ruins of the ancient capital of Gnosis. The palace at Gnosis was destroyed by fire from a volcano in 1628 BC and rebuilt a few years later bigger than before. It was three or four stories with extensive rooms and passages. The palace had a luxurious throne room with a large painting of a leaping bull. The legendary Minotaur with a bull's head and a man's body. It is said to have roamed the caverns below the palace. The Minoan worshipped a mother goddess who was probably an early version of Rhea the mother goddess of classical Greek mythology. The Minoan controlled sea trade between Egypt and the Asian Sea. They had a well-protected island and lived in peace and luxury. Because of this, they grew weaker as the Mycenaeans, who lived on the mainland, grew stronger and more skilled in naval warfare. Eventually, at around 1400 BC, the Mycenaeans wiped out the Minoans. The Minoan lived on, however, in classical Greek legends. The legend of Theseus who killed the Minotaur is probably a legend reflecting the Mycenaean overthrow of the Minoan. The island of Crete with its capital of Gnosis is a prime candidate for the great city of Atlantis of Greek legend. The first question a lot of people have is what about the Phoenicians? They are legendary people who dominated sea trade in the Mediterranean and were thought to be the earliest sea traders until, of course, recent discoveries in the 20th century have updated the historical record. The Phoenicians did not become a great sea power until 1200 BC. The Phoenicians are closely related to the Canaanite. We have already spoken of the Amaru, or as the Bible calls them, Amorite. They were the most northern and largest of the Canaanite tribes. The Phoenician people lived on the coastal cities of Canaan, Byblos, Tyre, and Sidon. The Canaanite and the Phoenicians shared the same religious pantheon of deities. The Phoenician word Baal was equal to the Canaanite word El. It simply means God. In the singular form, the word Baal or El was attached to every idol with a suffix describing the god's job, such as Baal of the mountain or Baal of the sea. Each region, mountain, or geographical form had an associated god. Each family had ancestral gods. There were gods of fertility, love, war, and anything that had an influence upon people. The principal deities included Astarte, Ishtar or Ashtoreth, the goddess of fertility, sexuality, and war, who is associated with the Sumerian goddess Inanna. There was also Molech, a bronze statue which was heated by fire and children were thrown into it. Molech's origins are unclear. The land of Canaan was populated by city-states and tribal leaders. The Greek, Roman, and English alphabet are based upon the Phoenician alphabet, and an even older version of the Phoenician alphabet has been found recently in the land of Canaan. To the north of Canaan, the Anatolian Peninsula was the home of the Hittites. There are three stages to Hittite history. 
the ancient Hittite period of city-states and tribal people, which became the old Hittite kingdom, and then became the Hittite Empire in 1450 BC, which came to an end in 1180 BC. Right now we are looking at the ancient Hittites, which were city-states and tribal leaders. According to the Bible, the original Hittites were descendants of Heth, a Canaanite. According to archaeologists, the indigenous Hittites were eventually oversettled and replaced by Indo-Europeans migrating down through the Caucasus Mountains. This change in the Hittites happened during the time of the Hittite Kingdom at about 1600 BC. The Hittites called their land Hatti and their largest city was Hattasus built upon a rock formation that was a natural fortress. Anatolia was abundant in timber, silver, gold, copper, bronze, and other minerals. They lived in small fortified city-states and built fortresses. They had an abundance of rocks and caves to build upon. The Hittites traded extensively with Naran Sin during the height of the Akkadian Kingdom. There was another nation in the region of the upper Tigris River called Assyria. Assyria would later become the first of the great empires. Not much is known of Assyria at this time period. They had a capital city called Assur and later moved it upriver to a new site called Nineveh. They traded with the Hittites and with the Sumerians until the rise of Sargon. This may be what caused them to move their city to a more fortified place, and that may be why they were not absorbed by the Akkadian kingdom. Naran Sin had them surrounded and probably cut off their trade with the Hittites. They may have been forced to pay tribute, but there is no evidence of that. We will be hearing a lot about the Assyrians in later episodes. The word Arabia does not appear in the Hebrew scriptures until the time of Joshua, about 1400 BC. The Arabian desert is a large uninhabitable desert except along the water on the south and east coasts. The mist from the water would allow the growth of vegetation including frankincense and myrrh, which was harvested and sold to the merchant traders. To most people, the Arabian desert was unknown, a dangerous place to travel, with few trails and even less water. It was just referred to as the wilderness, the desert, until the nation of Israel began to have dealings with the Arabian kings. The Arabian people, however, do date back to antiquity, but like all other peoples, they began as small villages and city-states, encampments of camel trains and desert nomads. As the nations developed in the Middle East, the Arab nation also developed, but it was protected kingdom surrounded by a vast desert. It was the gateway between the East and the West. It was people living in camel trains, moving goods back and forth. It was a large clearing market where traders would trade with traders and goods would be shipped in different directions. It was Sheba. The largest trading center in the Arabian Peninsula was the Kingdom of Sheba, which today is called Yemen. At its height of power, it stretched from Oman to Ethiopia. There was a lucrative trade passing through Sheba which joined the merchant sailors of the Indian Ocean to the merchant sailors of the Mediterranean Sea via a camel train route across the Arabian Desert via what is now called Petra to the shores of the Mediterranean Sea at Gaza. From Gaza, the goods would move by sea south to Egypt or north to Tyre to be distributed by the Phoenicians. There was also two or three large encampments along the route, which became a type of clearing market where everyone rested at the confluence of another trail. From Tima, the goods from Sheba would go west to Gaza or north to Damascus, a trading hub of the Arameans. The Arameans are another ancient biblical people who founded the city of Damascus. We will bring them into the discussion in a later episode. 
There was also a smaller trail across the desert from Duma to lower Mesopotamia. From Damascus, the goods would flow either towards the Mediterranean Sea at Tyre or to Aleppo and on to Karshemesh, the only crossing point on the northern end of the Euphrates River. From Karshemesh, the routes were linked to Anatolia and the Hittite, or they could go north into Europe or south along the Euphrates into Sumer, or south along the Tigris River into Assyria. These Arabian nomads had a very lucrative connection between the east and the west. Not only does frankincense and myrrh grow along the eastern and southern slopes of Arabia, they also move spices, cotton and grain from India, and gold, ivory, feathers, hides and wood from the eastern coast of Africa, the Ivory Coast. They also had China and Indonesia markets for silk, porcelain, spices, and rice. They traded from the west to the east, bringing bronze, dates, olives, copper, papyrus, or whatever was of value to be traded. Incense was particularly valuable to everyone in the ancient world. This was the primary means to approach the gods in almost every culture. Without incense to provide a sweet smell, you could not get help from the gods. Arabia produced much of the incense to supply the ancient world. This is why the trade route across the Arabian desert is named by historians the incense route. The monsoons of the Indian Ocean are a critical part of trade. The prevailing trade winds follow the seasons. From April to September, the winds blow north from Africa towards India and Indonesia. From November to February, the winds blow in the opposite direction. The sailors would wait for these winds and use them to move goods over long distances, thus connecting the African continent with the Asian by trade. The Arabian traders would also use these winds to reach as far as Indonesia. They have been doing this since ancient times. In fact, the word monsoon stems back to the Arabic word masim, meaning season, or the Hindi word mosem, which also means season. The, these two languages are at either end of the monsoon trade in the Indian Ocean. Ancient trade routes began with one man trading part of what he had with another man who traded part of what he had so that they both benefited from the trade. As trade gets larger between towns and cities, the load of cargo becomes larger. An investment into the ability to trade is made. A man has a camel or a ship and loads it up. He then acquires more camels or more ships until he has a business. As more business is made, these traders connect and a network of trade is eventually established. As trails become roads, more people are willing or able to use them. The land also plays a role in trade because the trader must cross a river or go around a mountain and these things can only be done in certain places. Of course, it took time for these routes to develop from one village to another or one nation to another. Even today, trade plays an important role in the development of civilization. The Silk Road is the name of the route which stretches from lower Mesopotamia across the Himalayan plateau and into China. The city of Susa, the capital of Elam, was important to all kingdoms who occupied the land of Sumer. Whoever controlled the land of Sumer immediately moved to subject the city of Susa. This city was a major trade hub between Asia and the Euphrates and the Tigris River Basin. The other end of the Silk Road stretching west from China probably was in its infancy at this time as well. As time went on, the ones going east met up with the ones going west, connecting the two in the narrow passes of the Himalayan mountains. The Silk Road also connects northward and into the Iranian plateau and also into Eastern Europe. The Silk Road was expanded into the mountains from China by the Han Dynasty in 200 BC. 
The Han Dynasty would not have invested into these roads unless goods had already been moving and they needed a better road. The Silk Road was named during the time of the Roman Empire, named after the tons of silk coming from China. They also traded heavily in tea and spices over the Silk Road. The Iranian plateau is noteworthy for its horsemen. These traders in this area likely used horseback or donkey to carry goods. As you get into India, you will find elephants being used to carry goods as well. The sea and river routes are more important because it is easier to carry larger loads on the water than on land. This is true even today. The Arabians dominated the incense route connecting the eastern and western sea until Darius the Persian from 550 to 486 BC had conquered the entire Middle East including the Arabian Peninsula and Egypt creating the Persian Empire. Darius the Great dug a canal through the sand from the Red Sea to the Nile River in Egypt. This canal was started by the Egyptians under Pharaoh Necho II in 590 BC, but was completed by Darius 50 years later. This was successful for a time, but the Arabs gained independence when the Persians fell. The canal of Darius quickly filled in with desert sand from the winds because the cooperation needed to keep the canal manned and cleared was no longer there. The incense route was never fully conquered again until the Islamic conquest, beginning with Muhammad around 600 AD. During the Islamic Caliphate, which followed, trade was cut off in Arabia as far as moving goods from east to west goes. The Indian Ocean side flourished under Islam. This is why Indonesia, southern India, the Horn of Africa, and virtually the entire coast region of the Indian Ocean is Islamic today. On the Mediterranean Sea, however, Islam was at war with the Christian nations. This was a hard time in history for Europe. It is called the Dark Ages. As trade dwindled, knowledge and innovation also dwindled. Europe was being starved from trade because the incense route and the Silk Road which had previously supplied Europe generously with goods, had both been cut off. Anyone who was captured by the Caliphate was taken as slaves or killed. The entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea was either part of the Caliphate or at war with it. When Constantinople fell, the Silk Road was also closed to European trade. You may have heard of Marco Polo in 1300 AD. During his time, the trade through the Middle East was cut off by the Islamic Caliphate. Marco Polo documented a land route connecting the European trade with the Silk Road to China, bypassing the Islamic Caliphate, saving European trade with China and India. Although Marco became a hero and saved Europe from starvation, this small, dangerous land route was not the many cargo ships that Europe needed desperately. It wasn't until 200 years later that the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama was able to sail around the continent of Africa in 1497 AD. He reached the Indian Ocean, opening sea trade once again between Europe and India. This was a treacherous sea route around the Cape on the southern tip of Africa, famous for storms and shipwrecks. Once you pass the Cape, you must then cross the Indian Ocean, which was full of pirates and Islamic sea traders who would have been foes, not allies. It was in the same decade that Christopher Columbus had run into the Americas in an attempt to reach India and China by sailing west. He took the risk of sailing off the edge of the earth, claiming that if he sailed west, he could reach the east because the world is round. This beginning of the age of discovery demonstrates the tremendous impact that trade has in shaping civilizations. The age of discovery is the time when the entire world was explored, mapped, and colonized. The Suez Canal today joins the Red Sea with the Mediterranean. It has been the focus of tension a few times since it was 
first dug by the Egyptian Suez Canal Company beginning in 1859. The idea of such a canal had been revived by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1799. The canal played a leading role in both Israeli-Egyptian wars of the 20th century. The Suez is one of two waterways, the other one being the Panama Canal, that allow merchant shipping to continue on a relatively short distance in a short amount of time around the globe. Whoever controls these waterways has a great influence on world trade and the movement of military vessels in a short period of time. This is why it is under International United Nations Agreement now that any ship of any flag may pass through it in peacetime or in wartime. This, however, doesn't always apply in war, as when somebody more powerful comes along and takes it. The Suez Canal is critical to the flow of goods between Asia and Europe, and crude oil between Arabia and America. It continues to be an international concern, as every nation has an interest in seeing the canal open and the economy flow. In October 1956, the Suez Crisis took place. After refusing funding from the USA and Britain to build the Aswan Dam project, President Nasser of Egypt declared the Suez Canal as the national property of Egypt. Nasser was also purchasing arms from the Soviet Union at this time. Israel, Britain, and France invaded Egypt in order to secure control over the canal for the Western powers, making the canal impossible because of the fighting. Political pressure from the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Nations led the three invaders to withdraw, but the canal remained closed by Egypt, creating a global shipping crisis, which lasted for six months crippling world economies. The Canadian Minister of External Affairs, Lester B. Pearson, who would later become Prime Minister, received the Nobel Peace Prize for proposing a plan to create the United Nations Emergency Force, who would keep the peace by policing the Egyptian-Israeli border, thus allowing the canal to open. This began the first UN peacekeeping mission. The Suez Crisis demonstrates many things, the importance of trade even today, and the geostrategic importance of the Middle East for the flow of trade, and the significance of keeping peace in this region. The region is directly tied to the Bible in history and in culture. With the Industrial Revolution and the importance of oil, this region has become even more important to the globe. Another question that jumps off the map is why didn't the land of Sumer engage in shipping on the Indian Ocean? The Persian Gulf is the body of water that stretches from the Indian Ocean into Mesopotamia, forming the northeast tip of the Arabian Peninsula. The two rivers of Mesopotamia carry a lot of silt, making the valley a fertile farmland, but also becoming a marshland as it nears the Gulf. Although the Euphrates and Tigris rivers were used for shipping along the rivers themselves, passing from the rivers to the Gulf was not so easy. This may have been simply because of too much silt and low water in the marsh, or it also could have been because of the people inhabiting the marshlands. Today there are a people in the marshes of Iraq known as Marsh Arabs. They claim to have lived there for thousands of years. They live in buildings made from reeds, and today they are Arab Muslims. These people today mostly are leaving the marshland and entering the cities of Iraq because drainage of the marsh has made it difficult for them to live there, and their young generations are seeking education and a modern lifestyle through the welfare systems of Iraq. Nobody really knows how long these people have been there or how they got to be there because in the marsh it is hard to dig for artifacts and ancient buildings made of reeds are long gone. They may have originally been Sumerian and were replaced by the Arabs in later times or they may have been Arabs who settled there from Arabia in ancient times. The marshes of Mesopotamia were simply avoided even until today. 
No army could march there. No fleet of ships could sail there. No benefit was seen in conquering a marshland full of poor people who lived on little islands in reed huts and traveled in canoes. There was a community there in ancient times called the Sea People, who were a haven for rebels against the Assyrian Empire, which helped the Babylonian Empire rise to power, as we will see in future episodes. Egypt has always been Egypt, and even in the most ancient times, it was a great kingdom. The entire next episode will be devoted to ancient Egypt. We'll see you then.